Hello, good afternoon, and thank you for joining the second edition of Jobberman Nigeria Talking Talent, the webinar series. It promises to be insightful and engaging. I see a lot of people already joining. Hello, thank you very much, Momoye. Heather, thank you very much for joining us. Um, Olari Waju, I see you, Gladys. Thank you so much for joining. Um, <clears throat> it's it's been a cold day here in Lagos, Nigeria. I hope you all are keeping warm, and most especially keeping safe at this time. Uh, for those that are just learning about Jobberman, Jobberman is the foremost online recruitment platform in Nigeria, and uh, it's been around for over ten years now. At Jobberman, we connect employers with the best talent in Nigeria. Uh, we have a pool of over 2 million candidates and counting that employers, uh, HR professionals uh, can pick from. Okay, thank you once again for joining. My name is Kemi Vaughn. I work with Jobama Nigeria and I will be your moderator for today. So we have a series of sessions lined up today. We have uh, three seasoned professionals to share insights on talent management with us. I am excited because they are indeed very, very, very powerful people. When I say powerful, I mean very, very intelligent, smart uh, people that are here today. They made it out of their busy schedule to be you know, part of this event. We're very, very happy to have them. Um, each speaker would speak for 15 minutes uh, before we go into the Q&A session. So please feel free to use the Ask a Question button to ask all your questions, and um, I will take them during the Q&A session, uh, or the speakers can answer them during the course of the webinar. Also, because we are all HR professionals, or because we are all um, business leaders, I'm sure we all have insights or ideas about some of these things. So if you'd um, you like to share your thoughts or your comments, please use the comment section. You can um, share your ideas or your thoughts um, in the comment section and we'll be sure to you know read them out um, before the next um, session so now without wasting much of our time because we are time stickers we would be discussing smart talent management and recruitment strategies in 2020 and beyond that is our topic for today so thank you all so much for joining i would now um, kick this session open we have our speakers available. They've been here since 11.45, ready to share <clears throat> insights with, with you all. So the first session for this morning is workforce right-sizing and its alternatives for long-term business successes. A um, little context around this. So workforce downsizing during COVID-19 has become a factor of working life as um, companies struggle to cut costs and adapt to changing market demands. Um, this topic will address whether this practice, uh, this practice achieves the desired results or not. And to anchor this session, we have um, Eda Oshia. Eda is a talent um, acquisition professional with ex extensive um, experience in recruiting across 23 countries in Africa. She is currently the group head of talent at Ringier One Africa Media. Uh, she has over 10 years experience in design and implementation of e-recruitment tools, as well as global talent management systems. She manages teams across East and West Africa, working with them to deliver Africa's finest talent across several industries. Eva, it is indeed an honor to have you in our place. Thank you so much for joining us. I would now move over to you. Thank you. Um, hello, and uh, really a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. So I think without further ado, I'm going to just pop into my presentation. Uh, let's go through it. And then obviously, if anybody has any questions, uh, and please don't mind my dogs behind me. Just the joys of working from home. I'm based in Cape Town. Very cold day in Cape Town. We've got a high of about seven or eight degrees. So I hear the love the dogs, right? <laughs> the joys of working from home. All right, so let's get straight to it. I'm just going to share my screen and get the presentation up and running. Please let me know when you can see my screen. It should be loading now. All right, are we ready to go? So when we look at workforce right sizing and the alternatives for long-term business success, there's a couple of things that you really need to keep in mind. And the first thing, obviously, is talent is the people factor. And your company is only as good as its staff on any given day. 
if you don't have the right people in the right places at the right time, you do not have an organization because you rely extensively on the people within your organization to deliver on the company's objectives. So the basics of workforce planning is what do you need to know? So if you're looking at six to 12 months ahead and right now things are very uncertain, so I'd probably suggest six months from a workforce planning perspective, this is what you need to be asking yourself is, what is the strategy? Where are we going? And do I have the right talent to execute on our company strategy as we currently pivot, shift, twist and turn as we come out of COVID-19 and get back to work? So what do I have versus what do I need is a question you need to ask. So do I have the right skills in terms of what we need to pivot on versus like, what do I actually need to bring this organization back to where it was or to get us to where it's going? Linked to your company strategy. So people with different skills gets us to where we need to be, but the two are intrinsically linked in terms of the company strategy. And I'm very sure that most HR people on this call or not HR people on this call are finding themselves asking the questions, what is our strategy? What are we doing? How are we pivoting? What do we need to change as we keep going? So the first we need to understand is what is our operational analysis that we need to do? So approved FD full-time employee per job family, HR professionals, we know this. What is the budget? What is the approved FTE per job family, which is linked to budget? From a business strategy, are we shrinking right now or are we growing? or are we remaining stable? Operational analysis. Do we understand the turnover trends, the attrition rates within those functions? Very important. Do we have enough succession planning? So succession planning, sufficient coverage for critical skills. And I always talk about the, the proverbial bus on this one, is if something happens to anybody in a critical role, do we have succession coming up behind us? because if not, we're really, really at risk. And then the last piece we need to understand from an operational analysis perspective is what is the market supply and demand of the skills I need? So do I have market insights as to what the market has versus what I need in my, in my country specifically, or even on a global scale? So I've done an operational analysis here. Um, apologies for the quality, it looks quite stretched but I'll go through it with you just to understand what I've given you and what that would look like on a sheet. So operational analysis, I'm taking that it's gonna be um, probably an MNC, um, it's West African role, it's the Nigerian office. Couple of questions we need to, we're looking for a regional sales manager to show you what that would look like. So some questions you need to know, do I have market insights? Do I know where good salespeople are sitting within my sector? Is it a business critical role? So if I don't have a regional sales manager, how much of an impact is that to my business? Is it a core skill? So sales is quite a core skill, especially good sales. The level of the role at a regional level, this is high. What is the degree of difficulty of this role? And I, and I, don't, want to, I just, don't want us to simplify how difficult a regional sales manager role is because they're managing multiple people across a region. So the complexity is there. Do I have multiple or similar roles? The answer to that in this example is yes. Do I need a pipeline? Yes. And the amount of screening required. So how difficult is it to find this person? So this is the immediate things you need to ask yourself when looking at one particular role. Then we go to exactly what I said here. Let's look at the approved FTE count, the trends, the turnovers, succession planning and market and supply in a one slide. So my approved complement I have is six. So I have an FTE budget from finance that says I can have six. I have a current complement of three. My turnover, my attrition rate at the moment is 20%, which is higher than normal. So that leaves me with three immediate vacancies, which makes my pain factor quite high. 
So we understand that analysis from the other sheet. The business strategy is we're launching new products, so we're growing. In this instance, we're going to grow. That's my business strategy laid out. What does my succession pipeline look like? If I look at the current complement of three, um, where else have I got? Who have I got that is ready now to take up this role within sales? I've said that currently we don't have any. Ready in one to two years, so these would be the sales managers below the regional guys. Who do I have ready in one to two years? I've just done a thumb suck and said probably one, and ready in two to four years, one. So if I was looking at hiring what I need to, my immediate vacancies, I don't have anybody ready now for my sales team in my own analysis for this example. If I look at market supply and demand, going back to this last quadrant here, I've said can be found in the market, but this particular company, we seem to hire the wrong people who do not stay. So this really is a representation of exactly this operational analysis, but using the numbers that matter. And you come out with exactly the business strategy, the succession pipeline, approved current immediate vacancies, and I've done a deep dive into what is required here. So the basics of workforce planning is really, it's actually B to the, I call it the B to the power of five. We're looking at the moment, the four main factors, and we'll look at the fifth one at the end. So then now you need to ask yourself, if I have three open vacancies and I have no succession, do I need to buy the skill? So if I need to buy the skill, that looks at recruitment. I've got to go and hire it. We all know that that is an expensive operation and can take time. So we look at it and say, do I need to buy? Because I don't have it within the organization right now. Can I borrow the skill? So do I need um, to, you know, do I need the skills long term? Can I borrow it? Which would be contract staff, and we'll look at the analysis of that. Can I build it internally? And how long will this take? And that speaks to training and development. And then the one that's very critical is bind. So how critical are the skills I currently have and do I need to bind them? So the three that you've already got in terms of my analysis here, if it's critical to the organization, you're going to need to look at how do I retain these right now because they are critical. So I need to bind them in order to keep them for a long period of time. So you'd look at the buy principle. Do I need to buy? Can I borrow? Do I need to build? And right now, do I need to bind? And that really gives you an outcome. So if you look at, this was our operational analysis, exactly what I went through, approved complement, current complement, turnover, immediate vacancies, we're growing. I now have my operational analysis in one slide. So I need to buy immediately. So what does that mean? I can market map and have a look at who else in the market is a regional sales manager that I could possibly headhunt. And I'm going to have to direct source in country or use an agency to help me. A long-term attraction for six months is I can run a LinkedIn blog about my company, what we do, that we're growing, that we're hiring and create that brand awareness. Uh, which is very important. So my immediate is I have to buy. I'm going to market map or maybe direct source, and I can look at six months in terms of long-term strategy by building a brand awareness. If I look now at my rest of my strategy, I can't borrow the skill. You can't borrow a sales skill for a short-term project because the skill is specific to have, and the contractual staff are not going to be, um, will not have buy-in, and they need to be permanent hires in order to see an impact. I could possibly build one of the de uh, and develop one of the incumbents at the moment. So that speaks to L and D. And then bind, I need to retain in the current role. So from this analysis here, I now have a strategic plan of exactly what I need to do. We're going to buy, we can't borrow, I'm going to build, and I'm going to retain the current staff that I have 
for those roles. I'm going to play you a video which will indicate some of the thinking behind this when we now look internally. I apologize up front for the quality. I tried to find a better quality one and I couldn't. Um, let's just play this and it'll give you a better indication of what we're talking about. And that brings me to the last one, which is, I said there was B to the power of five. This is the last one, balancing non-performance internally. So that video is just a really, really good example. And we can all identify those people straight away. We can tell the, the people that are derailing, et cetera, and that is called balance. So identify your non-performers early, either performance manage or move to different departments, but do it quickly. So taking that all into account when you're looking at moving forward across um, these un uncertain terrain that we find ourselves in is really workforce right sizing is a simple philosophy called B to the power of five, looking at do I need to buy? So recruitment, do I need to borrow? In this case, if we're looking at sales, it is no. Can I build internally? Do I bind the skills? And balance is Performance Management 101, either identify your non-performers quickly, performance manage, or move to other departments. Are there any questions? Any questions? Kemi, from your side? Yes, Eva. Yes, Eva, I do have a question. Um, yes. So my question is this, right? We'll still get to the, the Q&A session where I'm sure other people would have their own questions as well. But, um, you know, it was a beautiful presentation and I like the power of five, B to the five, right? Um, I have that. The question I have is, what should hiring managers avoid when downsizing? That is, if they have to downsize. Um, you know, let's say, for example, the company still um, needs to do a lot of or do some restructuring. And, you know, HR hiring managers have been asked to say, um, you know, you have to downsize regardless. You know, we don't have the capacity for this or we can't afford this at this time. You know, so what would you, what would your advice be to them? What should they do and how should they go about it? So, 
A very good question. And and again, um, hiring managers should make no decisions without HR right next to you every inch of the way. And when you and and by the way, and everybody on this call, if you want that simple template, I'm really happy to share it with you. It's just a really simple analysis. So when HR sits with the hiring manager and they talk about downsizing or having to restructure, I hate that word restructure because it means so many variables. So let's talk downsizing is to identify who is key and critical. What skills can I not live without? What skills could I possibly live without and uh, or move around in the organization? The first thing you need to look at is the poor performers. Um, and again, when you look at that little video, some of those poor performers are hiding and lurking in the background. And that little video, again, happy to share with everybody, is so effective because when you sit with the line manager and you show him video he can name them i've done it he goes it's mary it's sue oh my goodness that person at the back is the one that derails everybody that's where you start because the performers are critical to get you to the outset so you can do the analysis sit with your life pictures just show them the video they go you're gonna make me watch a video and i always go trust me and look from an HR, I mean, just it's easy. They go, that got it, got it, got it, got it, and then look at how that would work. Um, you don't get rid of poor performers and you manage them quickly. What happens to poor performers is they tend to actually become that guy at the back of the of the of the little cart. They pull people, mm -hmm. the grunt, they're the moaners, um, which destroy the ecosystem. They're the moaners who are then the distractors, um, who are not effective. So. Poor performers manage really closely. Um, I'm not saying poor performers can't be salvaged. They can be with a bit of guidance, but definitely that video and a line manager, you've got your answer very, very quickly. Thank you very much. So truly people, the people factor should be, um, should be prioritized. Uh, your company is just as good as the people. Thank you very much for that insight, uh, Eva. Thank pleasure. you so much. Okay, I think we have one question here before you go. Um, yeah. This person says, how do you create a balance to downsizing when you have too many amazing people? They are excellent in their skills, but too many of them are becoming a body to the company. So when you have a high-performing culture and high performers, you can't get rid of them. It's as simple as that. So I would look at other alternatives. Um, at the moment, companies are looking at bottom line, so obviously they're saying, you know, cut, we need to save money. If you've got good performers, keep them and rather look at maybe decreasing work time just to save some money and maybe put them on furlough. So decrease mm -hmm. salary by 20%, which means consultation. We don't want to lose you. We love you. We want you to come out on the other side. Can you work with us? We're all taking a cut in salary from the CEO down to the bottom. Drop salaries for a short period of time, which will give you instant saving. And as you start to come out of out of COVID or issues, everybody goes back to normal. So I would look at that before I let go of any high performers in an organization any day. And what happens if you do not identify the non-performance quickly? This is a question from Andrew. Yeah, the, you know, if you don't identify them quickly enough, they will definitely hold that organization back. And there are very simple ways to be able to do that. So really from a performance perspective, having clear articulated measures of what I expect from you on your day to day. And if you don't have that clearly defined, your non-performers are gonna be hiding because you can't performance manage them. If you're performance managing twice a year, look at bringing that into quarterly because you can't, you can't fix poor performance when it's been bad for six months. The damage is too great. If you're running performance management twice a year, try and bring it into quarterly. And also with all people is you shouldn't only be engaging with your staff once a quarter. You should be engaging that month and month. How are you doing? How are things going? So that you can pick it up really, really quickly. Um, and and I, would, I would always say engaging months on month on month, formal read quarterly, and you'll pick up your non-performers really, really quickly. And then you can either put them on an improvement plan or get L and D in to identify what the issues are. Um, you know, I'm very cautious to say I, I don't like the word PIP because PIP has connotations to it. PIP is a performance improvement plan. And that's the plan on how do we make it better? And that's what 
plays a really big role. So identify it quickly, put an intervention into place, and if they're still the wrong fit, I'm going to go back to saying this. Nobody hires a person that they expect to be a performer. We hire people because we love them in the interview and they had the skills. Our burden, or our role in HR, is to identify whether maybe there's a mismatch, performance improvement plan, and then if there's still no joy, try and maybe move them to somewhere else where they're better suited, or ultimately you'll have to let them go. High performance, keep poor performers, identify early, try and fix the problem, try and move them. Well, unfortunately, then the last resort is to let them go. Okay. Thank you very much, Heather. Thank, Thank you for you. your time. Um, that, was, that was very, very insightful. Thank you for taking your time to answer all our questions. Um, everyone, please note that Heather is still very much around, so feel free to use the Ask a Question button to ask all your questions about you know, downsizing an organization at this time. She would um, you know, provide answers in the Ask a Question button. So we'll move on quickly to the next session so that we don't waste too much time. The next session is Building Effective Talent Pipeline strategy with ATS, recognizing the fact that people are very, very important. Um, this particular session is about the applicant tracking system, which is also known as the ATS. It is one of the most important tools for employers. Uh, without one, it will be exponentially difficult and time consuming to track all of the applications that are coming in, especially at this time when you know there are a lot of um, pay cards and downsizing in organizations. People are now looking for the best organizations to work with. So what made, what that means is if you have, um, if you have um, a vacancy in your organization or you have an opportunity or a role that you're looking to fill, a lot of people will be sending in applications. So how do you identify the best people from the pool of candidates that you'll be getting or for the pool of applications? This topic will address what exactly an ATS is and why employers should opt for it when hiring. Um, to anchor this session, we have Ikena Obiao, who is the product manager at Jobama Nigeria. He has almost a decade of experience. Uh, he's knowledgeable in developing product market fit solutions that addresses real needs of customers. He is a strong believer that businesses exist for the, cost, for the customers and not the customers for the businesses. He has worked with teams within West and East Africa. Thank you very much, Ikena, for joining. And I need to also add that Ikena is very, very Nigerian. <laughs> he is very, very Nigerian. So please feel free to ask him all the questions that I have. Thank you very much for joining, Ikena. I will now move over to you. All right. Thank you. Taking our time from your busy schedule to join us. Um, we hope that um, this will really be impactful for your business. Um, so without taking much time, um, because time is far gone, I will just jump right into the presentation. I'll proceed to share my screen. Um, so please let me know when you can see my screen. Can you see my screen? Okay, great. Okay, cool. So I'm going to be talking about building effective talent pipeline strategies with an ATS. So what are we going to cover? We are going to look at what a talent pipeline is. We are going to look at what an ATS is. We're going to look at the benefits of having a talent pipeline. Why should we have a talent pipeline? And then we'll talk about some tips, um, strategies to build an effective talent pipeline. We'll then look at how an ATS helps with this. And then we'll take a quick tour of the Jobberman ATS and our talent search tool. So what is a talent pipeline? So this is basically a pool of candidates who are qualified, keyword, they are qualified and willing to fill a position within a company, usually way before it becomes vacant. So the keywords here are that they have to be qualified, 
they have to be willing to join the company and fill those roles. And you have these people way before that role becomes vacant. So this is quite different from when you have a role now and you put up the job ad and you probably have to fill it within two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. No, this is way before. So maybe six months down the line, you're going to have that role open or one year, you already have a pool of candidates. Now, um, this would typically consist of your internal candidates, that's people already within the company, because as um, Heather said, it's important that you have a succession plan, right, and pipeline within your company, right? And it would also consist of um, external guys. Now, why should you have the mix? The internal candidates are loyal to your company, and they already know the business. The external guys, however, bring diversity to the company and they help to fill skill gaps that are currently in the company. So there are probably some skills that people within the company do not have. And even if they were trying to even if they were to try to get those skills, it would probably take some time. So you need the mix of both. Now for the external candidates, right? These are usually passive job seekers who are qualified, but you've engaged with them sufficiently enough to evoke willingness to join your company when the time is right. As we all know, the greatest candidates, and maybe I shouldn't call them job seekers, they are already working somewhere. That's why they're one of the best. They are engaged somewhere, right? And so most of the time, if you just put up a job ad like now, they may not be actively looking for jobs. So they may not see your job ad or be willing to join at that time. So this is a proactive system of hiring rather than a reactive system. Oh, someone has just left and then you react and put up a job. And no, this is being proactive. Okay. Now, let's define what an ATS is. Very simple. An ATS is simply an acronym for applicant tracking system. And what is this? It's simply a software that enables you to handle, track, organize, and manage the different facets of the recruitment process. I guess we've, we've heard of this so many times. And I'm towards the, the end of the presentation. I'll just take a tour on the Jobberman ATS. Now, let's talk about the benefits of having a talent pipeline. I guess um, I've already mentioned one or two points, but let's, let's, let's do a deeper dive. You reduce the time to hire and reduce hiring errors. Of course, because you already have that pool, these people are qualified and they are willing to join. Once the position becomes vacant, it's as simple as just placing a call and say, hey, the position is now vacant, do you want to come? It also helps you to reduce hiring errors. So if you approach a knee-jerk approach to hiring, oh, we suddenly have this position, we need to fill it quickly. We need to fill it within two weeks, one month. It's most likely you will make a lot of errors, right? You will not do the due diligence of maybe um, doing an exhaustive search of all the qualified people. Um, you probably may not take time to assess the candidates properly because of time, right? So this would help you to eliminate that. You hire better and more engaged candidates. Why? Like I've said, you're already taking time to find them, identify, assess them, and build genuine interest. Because if you have a role, you need to fill within four weeks, right? You get a great candidate. The candidate is already involved in their company. They've been there for a while. Fine, you may be paying a lot more. But then they have some doubts. Um, do I know the company culture? Should I really move? And maybe they move, but while they're there, they're not so sure. And maybe after a while, they're not too sure they want to be here, and they leave. So this helps to solve that, right? You, you get candidates that have genuine interest in the company. You easily feel hard to fill roles when the time comes, saving you potential revenue loss. We all know that there are different types of roles, obviously. Some are quite easy to fill. Some are difficult. Some are highly technical roles, highly specialized, niche roles. And it takes time for you to source for those candidates. If you've not taken a proactive approach 
um, using talent pipeline, um, you run into a lot of trouble with these roles. And usually, those roles are very key roles. And the time you take, um, the time you, you spend in trying to find those candidates, the longer it takes, the more you lose uh, money, right? So you want to avoid that. Oh, and I've mentioned this before, the best professionals are passive. You need to endear them to your company way before you meet them. One of the days where we feel, oh, candidates are desperately looking for jobs. Remember, you're looking for the best. They are not desperate. Most times, 90% of the time, they're not desperately looking for jobs. So you actually have the hard work of attracting them to your company. So you need to take time, right, to endear them to your company. Make them want to work for you. Okay. Now, let's look at um, some of the strategies um, to build an effective talent pipeline. First is you need to have a plan. You need to identify the roles in your company that need a talent pipeline. There are so many roles in your company. It would be great and ideal to have a talent pipeline for all the roles, but um, you have limited time and resources, obviously. So you want to prioritize the roles that really need a talent pipeline and typically these are high turnover roles eg like sales um the, the 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 turn rate is very high they hire they go they hire they go it makes sense therefore to have a ready talent pipeline you know people who can easily fill those roles or the hard to fill roles the technical roles the niche roles then you need to build candidate personas for those roles because you know that these roles are very key um do not just let your recruiters go on a wild goose chase right um sit together from the um, business strategy and uh, hr perspective and identify who are the people who think will be a right fit what skills should they have what should their backgrounds be what companies probably have a similar culture as ours right so that when your recruiters are going to search for this candidate they know who they are looking for and they can identify them when they see them. You need to have a clear company branding strategy. Remember, I said, you are advertising your company, you are endearing these candidates to your company. So you need to make your company attractive. You need to think, okay, what, um, what do we put out there? What is, um, what makes us stand out? Probably we have a unique, a friendly um, uh, culture, right? um this is a nice place to work how do we showcase this to to the public maybe on a social media on a blog you have to have a clear strategy so that people already see you as a, a, a good company to work for probably you're, you're not one of the um tier one companies here yeah, maybe top 100 right you really have a lot of work to do in this regard then you need to define your employee value proposition why should I work for you? What career prospects are there within the company? How may I grow? If I come in, how will I grow? What are the um, uh, perks, the other perks that I can get aside just the pay? What, how would you give value to the candidates that are coming to work for you? You need to define this. And then, of course, like I've said before, you need to balance between internal and external candidates. If you only have external candidates, your internal, your incumbent um, staff will notice that there's no future for them here. They cannot grow, they would be resentful, and they would leave. So you have to strike the right balance. All right, so once you've had your plan, the next step is to source, right? Now, where do you source from? Candidates. Candidate pools, right? Databases. Um, for example, the Jobberman candidate database. We have over 2 million professionals on our platform. Large number, right? That's a good source to start from. Go in, swim, search. Search for those guys. You've identified their personas. Go after them with the right keywords. Find them. Contact them. Your ATS accounts. Um, I believe most people would already be using an ATS account. Hopefully, the Jobberman ATS, which is the best, 
the country right about now. Um, and how can you get candidates from your ATS account? There are applicants, right, that may not have been suitable for the role they applied to, but they are suitable for another role. So don't just toss it aside, right? When you identify a good CV, even though they're not, they may not be quite good for that role, they may be good for another role. You can put them in a candidate folder within the ATS. And the Jobberman ATS has this, which I'll show you later on. Now, former shortlisted candidates um, for a role that were not hired. So probably they were shortlisted. And we all know that the reason you may not have picked some other candidate may not necessarily be because they were not competent, but maybe because they were not ready to move at the time or some other circumstances. But they are good. You need to keep them on your radar. You go online, social media, professional networks. Um, these are also um, places where you can source for candidates. Events, offline events, conferences, seminars, where you have top professionals come, right? You meet them. You want to add them to your talent pipeline. Don't just meet them and let them go. Engage with them, right? And then referrals, referrals. Ask people, um, do you know someone who may be good for, for this role and that role? The next is to engage your pipeline. So you need to keep them engaged. Remember, I said you have to endear them enough to want to work for you. So you need to engage your pipeline. Some tips. You need to be honest, right? You need to let them know that the openings are not available yet so that they don't expect that, OK? Um, I thought you contact me for a role within four weeks let them know that there are no roles yet but you like them so much that you want them in your company and when a suitable position comes available you would let them know so you, you need to manage that expectation up front also don't spam them right so because we say engage them doesn't mean you need to contact them every week they get tired we all know this right and they wouldn't want to hear from you let them decide how often um, should we engage with you? Should this be uh, maybe weekly, monthly, once in three months? Respect their time, right? If you respect their time, they would be receptive to you. Sell your brand. They've told you how often they want to be contacted. Sell your employee, your employee value proposition to them. Remind them, these are some of the benefits of working with us. Share employee stories. Most times when um, a, a, a candidate has been in another company for so long and wants to move, they ask questions. They ask employees there, how is it like to work here? When you share employee stories, they feel, wow, okay, people are really happy working here. I think I'll be happy working here as well. Share major company milestones. It shows that your company is on a journey somewhere. Right, and and and, and this candidate to be like, okay. This company seems to be progressive. I'll probably like to join them. And then need to share relevant content around career growth. Now, it's a two-way conversation. Um, also, encourage them to ask questions about your company so that you can know their thoughts and answer them. Now, how does an ATS come into this? The Jobberman ATS. One, sorry, just a moment. I just want to confirm that everyone is still with me and hearing me. Okay, cool. All right, let me go back to sharing. Can everyone still hear me? Sorry, just checking in. If I can get one or two yeses. Great, great, great. All right. Okay, so how an ATS helps. You have a single point of truth, right? Because you're getting data of candidates from everywhere. You do not want it to be scattered, right? You probably have a recruitment team, different people. Have everything all in one place. It makes everything same, right? So collect all candidates in one place. 
sort into folders and have common data sets because on the ATS, everyone has to have you know the same data sets and so you can compare uniformly. Of course, you don't spam your email box. Everyone sending CVs here and there. Um, I mean, like you probably don't want 200 CVs in your mailbox. No, and ATS takes away that. As I've mentioned before, it's also a source of existing candidates interested in your company. Like I said, from previous applicants to your jobs, and all these applications are stored in the ATS for your future uh, reference, right? And you can add the candidates into special um, folders. Remember, a candidate that may not have been 100% qualified, maybe 70% qualified at a particular time, down the line could have obscured himself and become a great fit. Also think of that. ATS is the German Meditators. It has search and filtering functionality, so you can easily run you know, keyword um, searches and apply um, distinct filters across so many candidates all at once. Um, we have a candidate emailing feature. So right from there, you can just email the candidates in your pool or people that have applied to your jobs. Skills assessments. You may not know this, but um, on Jobberman, we have um, an assessment product where when you're advertising your listing, you can actually add an assessment to the job and everyone who is applying for it has to take the test. You can then use their scores to easily filter and sort. So you know how people apply carelessly, have 500 people applying. You just run the filters with, with the scores. It helps you identify those who are experts. You already know the top guys, and then you can start from there, making it very seamless. You wouldn't see this on another um, ATS. We have it on the Jumperman ATS. And then um, structured recruitment funnel. So there's a structured recruitment funnel, which will help you so that you can move the candidates down the funnel, right? Now, I've spoken about the ATS. Um, let's just take a brief tour of the Jobberman ATS and a talent search feature. Okay. Right, so welcome to the Jobberman applicant tracking system, right? There are so many things, and because of time, I'm going to be very brief. You can post a job listing, clearly, of course. I wouldn't go into the job posting form, but I'll show you a sneak peek of our assessment catalog. So while posting the job, you can choose to add an assessment. You basically select the job function. You see we have accounting, admin, business development, customer service, so many, right? Even up to IT and software. When you choose the job function, we have various sets of assessments. E.g., you can assess for Android developer, Java, and so on. There are even two tips which can show you what the assessment is all about. And then you can also select the experience level. Right. So just imagine for all the jobs you're posting, you just select your job function, select the assessments at the experience level. And all candidates applying for the job will have to take the test. Now, let us look at managing your applications, especially the ones that have an assessment. So, for instance, this is so many jobs here. You can search for a particular job. There we go. This job has an assessment, so it says assessment active. Now, let's look at it. First, we have an overview. You can see candidates. You can see the different um, statuses. Remember I said you can move them down the recruitment funnel. Um, in review, shortlisted, hired, not suitable. And here we have the breakdown of candidates. So some are beginners, those who score like 0 to 25%, intermediates, 26 to 50 Proficients, 51 to 75%. Experts, 76 to 100%. We show you the breakdown here. Now, you go into your list of candidates. Right? They are search filters. You can filter by assessment score and so many more. For instance, 
Let me look at those that I have viewed. I can see that they are 14. All right. Let's say I want to see those that are experts based on the assessment. From that 14, it has come to four. So imagine if this was a thousand, probably bring it down to maybe hundred, right? Making it super easy. And then you can see those that are experts. Furthermore, you can even decide, I want to see the best of the best on top. You can sort by assessment score. Previously, we saw a person of 80%. Now there's someone with 90, he's on top, making it super easy. Another key thing, remember, we talked about talent pipelines and having like candidate pools, adding candidates to special folders. You can easily do this. So for instance, from here, if I select, I can select, let's say these candidates and I select actions, I can say add to candidate pool. So I click, these are the pools I've created. So let's say account managers to consider or consider for finance analysts. And then I add them to the pool, or I can even create a new pool from here. Now, let's see our candidate pools. We created a couple of candidate pools. Remember, you can add from different sources. We added from the job application in this case. I said consider for finance analysts. Let me view the candidate pool. Great. These are the people that I added. There were four previously, now there are six, right? So various candidate pools, you can sort all your candidates in different candidate pools and have everything in a structured manner. I also talked about emailing, right? You can email candidates. So for instance, right from the ATS, I can decide that I want to send the, the candidates an email. I simply put in my subject, my message, and send. So we have the emailing feature here. And you can select candidates and move them to the different statuses, in review, hired, not suitable, shortlisted, and so on and so forth. So of course, time will not permit me to go through everything, but um, this is just a little sneak peek, you know. And if you want to know more, um, want us to give you a food tour, you can just send an email to info at jobberman.com. And um, for the remaining few minutes, I'll just have a very brief um, sneak peek on our talent search feature. I showed you the ATS, you're managing candidates. We have a talent search feature. You can search the entire Jobberman database for candidates. Remember, I said this is a good source of talent, right? So let's say I'm looking for campaign manager. Voila. 1,503 people. There are so many filters. When last they updated their profile, industry, even their salary expectations, highest qualification skills, current employer, so many, right? Oh, let's say I want to be particular. I even know the company I want to check from. Let's say government, but please don't put from government. Okay. And yeah, I have this. I can easily preview, you know, the profile, the CV, and then from there, add to the candidate pool. For instance, this is Kemi's profile, Kemi here, right? I can see her profile. I can see um, her CV as well. I can add them to the candidate pool. So for the sake of time, I will just um, stop there and uh, I hope um, you've, you've been able to get a high level idea of um, talent pipelines, um, why it is important, um, the, the different strategies, where an ATS comes in, and you've been able to have a good feel of the Jobberman ATS and uh, Talent Search too. Of course, to know more, um, you can just do us an email and we'll be glad to take you through. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Ikena. That was very, very insightful. And thank you for showing my profile as well. <laughs> thank you very much. That was very, very detailed. Um, remember, we're discussing smart talent management and recruitment strategies in 2020 and beyond. And that's why we had to ensure that that session you know, took so much time because that is one smart way to ensure that you have the right candidate or the right talent pool. Remember, we said the people factor. It is very, very important that you have good people in your company as your company is just as good as the people that are working in your organization. Um, remember to use the ask a question button to ask your questions. I see lots of questions in the comment section. Thank you very much, um, Edda, for answering some of these questions. Thank you, Dupre, as well, for your comments. Um, keep asking those questions. Keep sharing your thoughts in the comment section. If you have a question, use the ask a question button. If you want to share your ideas or your thoughts, remember to use the comment section so that other people can also learn from you. Remember, we are all professionals and we want to make this session as engaging and as possible. Um, we, we would like to beg you to please give us additional um, 20 minutes more. We promised it was supposed to be an hour, but because of you know how engaging the session has been, we didn't want to you know cut um, the speaker as was here, and we saw that a lot of you were you know asking questions and were dropping comments, and that's why we had to let it uh, span longer than it did. Um, the last session is a very important session. So this speaker is one that you know we literally asked to come back. Before because the last webinar, the feedback we got via our feedback analysis was, you know, she was an outstanding speaker and you'd love to have her again. And so we have brought her again um, for this webinar. So this last session, we'll be discussing strategies for hiring and retaining the best talent amid, amid COVID-19. So COVID-19 has impacted how, uh, many, how many businesses operate. Uh, many businesses have shifted their operations online due to this. So this topic now will address uh, ways hiring managers can adapt their hiring strategies to attract top talent or top candidates in a remote world. And to anchor this session is Dupe Akinsehu, who is a seasoned HR professional with extensive years of practice that cuts across management consulting, financial services, pharmaceutical, and FMCG across West and Southern Africa. Thank you very much, Dupe, for coming again. Um, I will now move over to you. Wow, guys, it's been an amazing journey, I must say. So I want to acknowledge the leadership of Jobberman. I want to acknowledge the organizers of this event and, of course, our colleagues who are on this call and making it a worthwhile experience. Thank you so much for having me once again. I, I feel so flattered, actually. And I must say that your talent attraction strategy is very top-notch for having me come back. Um, I also want to acknowledge the previous speakers. He thought that was fantastic. Guess what? I had to reach out to, you know, to them at the back end, like, Sorry, what, what, what was Heather's topic again? Because I'm really feeling like, okay, so what do I have to share? And of course, the session on the product, oh my goodness, I'm, 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 I'm sold already. So if your organization is not using the skills assessment already, please, I want you to jump on that bandwagon now. You don't want the headache of recruitment, okay? Thank you so much. So my slide will be projected and I'm just going to be wrapping, you know, a lot of all the things we've heard today. I'm, I'm not going to say anything you've not heard, but maybe I'm going to be driving home some points a lot, a, a lot more. And um, one of the things I have at the back of my mind that I might use as something we can relate to is, um, you know, when we think of recruitment, we think of, you know, a relationship between a boy and a girl, right? So when a guy is trying to woo a lady, right, the question is, what's recruitment strategy? So imagine that super talent as that lady you're trying to, you know, woo, okay? So we're going to be talking about strategies for hiring and retaining the best talent amid COVID. And um, I'm just going to, so if you look at the agenda, I'm going to just, you know, high level talk about what talent management is. I'm going to be sharing with us, <laughs> yes, Eva, I'm going to be sharing with us what a core talent management process looks like. And then we're going to be talking a little bit, you know, what strategies, you know, we should put in place for attracting. And then what are some of the challenges we may have with selection. And finally, um, I'm going to talk about smart solutions to hiring and, of course, retaining talent. So 
Moving on to my next slide, as you can see, um, talent management is something a lot of us are familiar with. I guess a lot of us here are HR professionals and you know we, we have talent. And I think um, one of the things we also need to establish is different organizations have different meanings for talent. Some people think or say that talent, their talent philosophy is different, right? They believe that some organizations believe everybody is talent. Some other organizations use talent only for their high potential employees, okay? So you need to be clear in your organization where what your position is, where talent is concerned. But generally speaking, talent management um, speaks of a systematic, strategic, and organized way of getting the right candidates on board and helping them grow into their optimal capabilities. We believe that every individual has a potential. Every individual has something to offer. But the question then is, based on what you have to offer, is, is what you're offering, right, meeting my business need? That's where fitness comes in, okay? Are you the right fit for this job? We know you're good. We know you've got experience. We know you've got skills. But then are you the right candidate for this job? It doesn't mean you're not good, all right? We just need to ensure we have the right fit. So in a talent management process, getting the right candidate on board is very key. And, of course, helping them grow into their optimal capabilities. And the interesting thing is we can spend the whole day on just these two points. But of course, the previous speakers have done justice to why it is important, you know, for us to not just have the right strategies in place, you know, for attracting and recruiting, but also for us to ensure that we have a rich talent pipeline so that when we are in a case of having to hire for especially our critical roles, we already have ready candidates to fill those roles for us, okay? So moving on. The question is, what does the talent process look like? So if you look at this image, it's a bit um, blurred, but please, I hope you can see the main highlights of it, right? It, it, it starts with workforce planning. And like Eva said to us, right, which is obvious on this slide as well, you have to start with the organizational strategy. You cannot come with a talent management strategy that is not solving the, the business problem. And what makes this period a bit interesting and unique to other you know, maybe recruitment seasons we may have had in our different organizations is the fact that the organizational strategy is changing quite rapidly. And it, it, it is such because it, it, it is doing that because there's a lot of changes going on around us. And a lot of organizations are finding you know, ways to adapt or respond to all of the changes happening. So as HR professionals, this is the time for us to be very, very close to the business. We cannot do things the way we used to do them. We cannot respond to HR activities the way we used to drive them. We need to be very, very intentional and strategic in how we deliver solutions to the business. So he that took us through a process and of course it starts with the right planning. So based on the strategy of the organization, if you're able to assess what we have versus what we need to achieve the business strategy, do we have, you know, the right skills in-house? Do we have the right talent in-house? And so when you're able to identify the gap that exists in your company, you're able to have a proper workforce planning in place. Workforce planning helps you to know what you have and what you don't have and what you need in order to be able to move in the direction where the business is going. Now, once you're clear on what your vacant or you know talent gaps are within the organization, and let me quickly mention, no, please, let's go back. Let me quickly mention that, you know, um, in, in the workforce planning, right, sometimes, you know, at this period, you know, there's a lot of mindset around organizations are downsizing but that's not blanket truth that's not the blanket truth some organizations are actually growing you know so being sensitive to the business helps you know whether we are growing or we are shrinking right if you look at your organization right now the fact that your strategy is changing may mean that you need right now like immediately to hire new skills because maybe maybe let's say for instance you know i, I think it was either who cited an example of, you know, maybe a company coming up with new products. So in response to market demand and maybe customer, um, all of, you know, customer behavior and all of that, you know, there's a need for you to come up with a digital product. So you have people in-house who do not have the required software skills that are needed to de develop those products. Most likely you have to go out. So we cannot take a, a, a fixed 
stand as HR professionals to say, no, organizations are not recruiting at this time. No, that's very far from the truth. So we need to know what is peculiar to our organizations in order to come up with the right talent attraction or talent management strategies. So moving to the next point, you know, um, so if you're a gentleman on this call and you know you want to get married you know how guys take their time right i want to get married but then i need to be very sure i'm ready i need to put the plan in place i need to get an apartment i need to do this i need to do that because there are certain things you want to do to attract the kind of woman you want okay so what are the things that we need to do to attract the kind of candidates that we want. So I have a couple of things. I said, you first need to define your target audience, okay? You cannot just go out there and say, we're looking for candidates. No, candidate is very, very general. You need to be sure, you need to be very, very crystal clear on the kind of people you're looking for. Because when you're clear on your audience, then it informs, you know, your approach to, to, to attracting those people. Then, of course, what, the, the next thing after defining your target audience, I said, improve your employer value proposition. What do you have to offer? And when we talk about offer, we're not just talking about the money. The question is, what does your brand represent? There are some brands that you will see, you know, out there that a lot of us, even as children, we're growing up, you see those names you want to work in those organizations, right? And it, it, it's something that we need to, the question is when people see your brand out there, what do they see? What do they want to do? Is it endearing? Do they want to work for your organization? So you need to take note of your employer value proposition because it ultimately adds to your employer branding. Of course, increase your online presence. You can't tell me you want to get married and you're very anti-social. You can't tell me you want to attract good candidates and you're very anti-social. This is the time of social recruiting this is the time where your social capital or your social currency when, as an organization will go a long way in helping you achieve your recruitment objectives of course then the next thing on my slide says you know you need to create relevant and valuable platforms for potential candidates you know um i can't remember i, I think it was the previous speaker i didn't quite get his name Ikechuku, I think, right? He did mention to us that you can organize conferences. You know, sometimes as, as professionals, as organizations, we need to understand that some things, you know, it doesn't, these days it doesn't cost money. Before now, we thought having conferences, having webinars for candidates who may never accept your offer or something, you know, may, may eat into our budget. But we need to understand at this point that nothing stops you from creating platforms of engagement for the kind of people you want to bring on board, right? This is the time for you to go all out, be very present, you know, on, on relevant platforms and, of course, offer relevant and valuable content that will keep attracting people. He suggested, you know, maybe conversations around growth, conversations around your social impact, conversations around what you're doing to make your your, your organization a great place to work. This is not the time to be silent. In Africa, we know that, you know, there's this popular saying that if you keep quiet, you know, everybody will keep quiet with you. Your situation is going to... So this is not the time to keep quiet and say, you know, my work will speak for me. No, your work ain't going to speak for you. You need to speak about what you're doing to make a difference in the life of your employees, what you're doing to make a difference in the community. These kind of things, put your brand out there and create a curiosity in people to want to find out more and be a part of what it is you're doing. And of course, uh, my next point, you know, says that you need to improve, of course, your social impact, okay? So this is not the time where, you know, you, you just tell us about your numbers. You know, people don't even read financial statement these days, you know, <laughs> except that your shareholders. People don't read all those things. Of course, I still do. I remember one company reached out to me a while ago. I had to go online, like, are they still a going concern? What's their balance sheet looking like, right? But then much more than their bottom line, people want to know whether you care, because if you don't care even about the environment in which you play, if you're not making a difference, Difference in the lives of people who may not directly add value to you, especially in the media term, then I'm really not sure if you know there is you, you will count me or take me very seriously. Because if you can do those things for people who don't matter, then I can imagine what you will do for 
people that are now serving on your on your on your team okay so you see a lot of you know corporate organizations going out there you see jobberman organizing this webinar they are making a difference in the lives of hr professionals some of these things maybe you already know but bringing this platform and refreshing our mind sharing with us current trends at, at this time to help us you know improve on our deliveries you know it, it, it brings them to mind so you need to be very intentional about your brand positioning as an, as an organization. So moving on, and then I said you can also introduce, I mean, these were things mentioned earlier, you know, introducing employee referral initiatives. Maybe it's going to come to a time where we, we, we will begin to find out, you know, what's the ratio of, you know, internal referrals to people we attract externally. But the, the truth is, you know, internal um, people referring people to your organization from within actually carries weight, weight okay? Because these people are your first-hand consumers. It's like, you, you know, you, you, you go to a store or you shop from an individual or an organization because you had a great experience you're telling others about it oh i went to this restaurant i had such a fantastic you know you're giving an unsolicited you know feedback to people guess what people will want to go and experience it and that's what it is when you're able to give value to your current employees they want to tell everyone about it whether you hire, you pay them to or not. But of course, now having an employee referral initiative in-house, you're going to see a lot of people jump on it if you have a, a, a good employer value. And I'm, when I talk about employer value proposition, we're not just talking about paper documents. We're talking about tangible employee experience where people are able to tell their stories, right? So going on to the next thing. Now, when you put all of these strategies in place, I mean, imagine that guy looking all dope, looking all sharp, looking all set. It becomes every woman's dream. <laughs> Everybody wants to have a piece of the cake. But guess what? This guy is looking for just one person. The same way you're attracting, well, I mean, when you put all the efforts in and you become the, the, the kind of employer everyone wants to work with, right? You're going to be overwhelmed, right? A lot of great people will want to work with you. And so this is where the recruitment challenges come in. And then you're overwhelmed with a lot of applications you have a lot of um even sometimes you attract both the good and the bad okay so, so some people technically can can fit the job but culture wise they may not so when we talk about quality we're talking about culture fit and skills you know fit all right very very aligned of course you also maybe attract cosmetic applicants when i say cosmetic applicants like i mentioned in the chat box earlier cosmetic applicants are people who have done a great job in making over their cv and while it is not bad to do a CV make makeover. I mean, see, adjusting your CV is very good. Um, putting it in a way that's going to attract the employer, you know, make you go through um, a the selection ATS rather is very good. But then the truth is, now those people who do not have stuff are beginning to see that you know what? I think I also need to doctor this CV to look in a certain way, even though they can't defend the years of experience, they can't defend the skills they put on it, they can't defend all of those things at all. So you you have you have quite a big challenge, you know, in in um, selecting or identifying the right fit. But then you will now see that there are smart you know solutions that have been put in place that can help you see through this you know this challenge you might be experiencing. So the first thing is not just using technology enabled solutions or recruitment processes, but using one like this, I mean, this job at man skills assessment is something that we cannot even, you know, overemphasize because of the beautiful benefits or the addition of having the assessment in that ATS. So it's not enough that as an employer, you use an ATS, but how is it helping you? What value is that ATS bringing to the table? So you see that you're able to, you know, uh, test candidates, you're able to filter candidates based on their performance in the test. You're also able to filter. If anybody saw the presentation, there was something that caught my attention. Of the four successful people, you know, the four people at the expert level or of proficiency in the test, I realized that the person who scored the highest had seven years experience, while the other one had just about two years experience. And I do know, of course, that years of experience don't matter in that sense. But imagine someone who has the experience and is also super smart about it. It just goes on to complement one another, okay? Because some people can have head knowledge and not have the requisite experience that will help you 
get the job done once they get into the company, right? So they are the kind of people, yes, they have the head knowledge, but because they've not really done it, when they come on board, they are not able to hit the ground running. Of course, the next thing, of course, is to build a talent pipeline. How do you do that? You know, a lot of things have been said around this, so I'm not going to flog it, but we will say that, you know, building an internet talent pipeline is very useful, is a smart way, because it helps you reduce the turnaround time to your recruitment, and, you know, um, of course, introducing referral programs would also help because when referral programs happen, people know you, they are able to find who can fit to your car, who maybe can do the job, you're able to shift appropriately to find the right fit for your jobs. Then finally, about... Okay. Thank you. We sincerely apologize for the break in transmission. I guess we had uh, we have some technical difficulties. We just okay. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate you, Alex, Alex, Oluremi, Francesca. Thank you so much. So we'll be talking about the recruit retention strategies now. Are we together? Okay, so the first thing, like I mentioned earlier, is to be clear on your business strategy. Okay, I'm just going to run through. Do I have the time? Just two minutes. Oh, no, we, we are actually yeah. out of time. No problem, then. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for coming, Dupe. Thank you all so much for hanging in there. We really, really do apologize for taking so much of your time or for running out of time. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Remember, should you have questions or, and, or should you have any question or you need more insight into some of the tools that we we'll discussed today, please feel free to send us an email at info at jobberman.com. Our team is on standby to answer every and any question that you might have. Um, also, we would like to say a very big thank you to all the speakers for standing in. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the insight that you shared. They were really, really amazing, and we are very, very happy to have you. Um, also, we do hope that when next we call on you, you would answer us and you would come and share from your wealth of experience with us. And for everyone that has um, been a part of this session, thank you so much for joining. Please spread the word. Let people know that, you know, Jabberman is the number one platform in Nigeria. Jabberman is a place for, you know, you to have the best talent and, of course, um, you know, get more information about recruitment and talent management um, strategies. So we would like to call it a day. Um, we will be sharing um, a survey form with you all. Please feel free to share feedback with us. We would love to hear from you. We would like to know how to make this session even better or how to make our webinars better. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Kemi Vaughn again, and um, thank you for making the date with us. We do hope to see you next time. Please fill our survey forms, and we'll be sharing this recording with you. So if you missed any part, if you joined us late, don't worry, we've got you covered. We'll share this recording with you. Thank you all so very much. We hope to keep doing business with you, and we hope to have you join us next time. Dupe, Eva, Ikena, you've been amazing. Thank you all so much and thank you to our amazing audience. Do have a lovely one. Bye-bye.